City Radio and the new gods of Supertown. My name is Eric and I'm here today broadcasting with Michael Kester. Oh, hey, good to be here. I am a rhinestone tiger in a leisure suit. Oh my god. Uh, I don't really have a smooth way to talk about the double feature uh, <laughs> this episode, but it's like a sex fueled southern movies with racial tones of racism to various <laughs> degrees. Um, I hadn't even thought of this, but right before we started recording, you also pointed out it's hip hop stars of varying degrees. Yeah, I mean, the, these who are films, the stars and what are the movies? The hip hop stars are uh, this is um, Puff Daddy and Most Def's Joint, Monsters Ball, uh-huh. and then um, not to be outdone, we also have Justin Timberlake and David Banner starring in Black Snake Moan. Wow, that's weird. So we're gonna spoil the movies. Um, you made a joke that kind of spoiled the movies last week, but not really. <laughs> they both do coincidentally, uh, there's chapters, skip over this. They both do <laughs> kind of end with that, um, moment of, Hey, it's going to be okay. That's kind of weird. Everything's going to be okay. It is weird. You know what else is weird about that, Eric? Is if you told me that I would tell you that that was stupid and bullshit and I hated it and I'd rather watch Hellraiser seven. Um, wow. But We'll talk about that when we get to um, Monsters the movies. Ball. Yeah, yeah, not uh, not Hellraiser Seven, but the uh, <laughs> the other thing. But what you were gonna say, I think, is that uh, when we have that chat in Monsters Ball, you might like the ending. It's possible. Yeah, we'll talk about the ending of Black Snake a little bit. Uh, other thing I want to talk about is Kickstarter dot show dot com. Mm, I've heard about this. I wanted to. Yeah, I'm glad you've heard about it because we're down to the fucking end, right? <laughs> um, to put it frank, like we want to do more show and we need your help badly. So go to kickstarter.doublefeatureshow.com and uh, we're asking you for a favor, but we decided to reciprocate and let you dominate our show, get producer <laughs> credits. You can chain our show to the fucking radiator. That's basically that's basically it. We've designed a, what I think is actually a really cunning if i can pat ourselves on the back we designed a way to completely let the audience participate in kind of brainstorming phases of the show and then we could use the tiny thing we're good at which is pairing movies uh-huh. to take all of their suggestions or their chapter demands, right over really. them <laughs> um, well to take their demands and see if we can make coherent shows out of them but we also want to give people additional content which i'm pumped about so there's a video on there. We tell a little uh, little double feature secret, which at this point, you know, fuck it. It's like the end, right? We should, yeah. we should talk about this a little bit. Yeah, just in case people aren't going to go. Um, coming to you uh, live on tape from Cupertino, California. Is yeah, that... live on tape from Cupertino, California. You're in a little window on my computer. Yep. Uh, you're still in Chicago. I am. In beautiful Chicago, which Firmly... is kind of shitty weather right now and i'm Horrible. in i'm in actual beautiful california but it's california and not chicago so it's right. uh, tragic and um i mostly uh haven't brought that up on the show because i ball my eyes out yeah uh which i'm gonna attempt to not do right now so yeah you and i are separated by two thousand fucking miles right and that's made our show ridiculously hard to do yeah so we've been kind of last second mad dashing to get this done and somehow have managed to scrape together a show with less and less time to spare every single week right and we're uh we're about coming to the end there's a lot of just drastic changes in our life that are making that hard to do unless we change the way we do it which is what we're planning to do with this kickstarter so fingers crossed on that yeah i've have uh never been more terrified in my life than this uh worst last thing week. you'll ever do yeah kickstarter's the worst thing you will ever do <laughs> until it's over then it's the best thing you ever did god i hope so please don't let me be wrong it's uh we basically put everything we have left in us uh into this kickstarter campaign so kickstarter.doublefeatureshow.com Craig Brewer is a name that I feel like might not get enough attention in this conversation. Uh So he's the first guy I want to mention. All right. He did Hustle and Flow. Yeah, he did something else that's more interesting to me. Sure, let's go with Hustle and Flow. 
Footloose? Is that what you're going to? I'm going with Terriers. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. The well, FX so... show that got canned after one season? Yeah. So, well, he's he's done a lot of TV work. I yeah. was going to stick to the film stuff and Hustle and Flow and, and this movie. I mean, this was his last writer-director film. Sure. But tell me a little about Terriers. It's this really great show. It was short-lived. It was on FX. It was starring Danelle Logue, who I'm pretty sure we've probably seen on Double Feature before, uh, solely because I like him. So while Terriers may be my favorite thing he's done, um, he directed the pilot and he had some affiliation going through. But my, I think his strongest thing is his ability to combine a genre of music with film. Sure. Black Snake Moan feels like a film version of the Delta Blues. Oh my God, does it? Hustle and Flow is a film version of independent hip hop. Yeah, totally. And up and coming gangster rap. Sure. Um, but to Black Snake Moan specifically, if you were to listen to the Mississippi Delta Blues, you know, it, it's interesting because you listen to it and it's you know it's all from it's all from the the forties and fifties and and it's all it sounds like shitty vinyl and it's crackles and pops and everybody's playing a shitty sounding guitar and they're singing their heart out, but it never really gets that edgy. Yeah. But you combine that with the actual thing that was happening, which is, you know, the hot, sweaty South and, and racial oppression. And that's when you get an electric guitar with more edge than any goddamn Metallica song you'll ever hear in your life. Yeah. But uh, I think we start at the beginning of Black Snake Moan. I always have trouble describing this movie to people uh, because of some of the the advertising and so forth. Yeah. And I definitely want to talk about that. But, uh, I mean, what is this about? Uh, you know, I think Black Snake Moan is about two people who are on opposite ends of the same problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, what happens when... Two people who could potentially take the same decision. They could both decide that they're going to take control of their lives and they're going to be the agent of change. Mm -hmm. And instead, when somebody is so adamantly not going to... <laughs> I mean, this is, this is a story of two incredibly strong-willed people who refuse to change. Mm -hmm. Instead of breaking a person's will, which the film could ostensibly be about, right? it's about... A person rediscovering the depth of their own will. Sure. Chaining a white girl to your radiator. It's people trying to, I guess, cope with pain until they can bury it. It's very much, I mean, I think we should use the blues as the hypothesis of, uh, of the movie. Yeah. It kind of tells you, you know, everything you need to know about the heart and soul of the characters. There, And that's one of the things that's very appealing about the blues for as many... Um, kind of stories the same stories are told in various blues songs mm -hmm. i think in a broader sense it's about you know a feeling it's about downtrodden pain and emotion sure. and someone has wronged you and uh when i say on a broad sense i mean you know the world has wronged you yeah anytime anything bad has happened the blues is yeah this way to kind of get it out and it's the world's got you down and it's not getting any better right <laughs> right that that's the difference between the blues and any other genre of music is you can take rock music, you can take pop music, rap country even. Um, and it's this kind of thing where, yeah, this is happening, but on the bright side, I got Jesus <laughs> on, the, that... on the bright side. There's always pussy sure. uh, on the bright side, drugs and alcohol, right? The blues is on the bright side. I've got the blues, <laughs> right? Yeah, <laughs> the blues is the thing that's there for you. It's to keep you company. And in being that, I mean, you know, it's like uh, the scene towards the end of the movie where they're at that club. Everybody can come together and kind of unify under that. It's, I guess it's kind of about keeping you company while you're going through that stuff. And that's very much another thing that Black Snake Moan is about. Sure, but that's not what the advertisers would have you think that no, Black Snake Moan is about. About a chain. Black Snake Moan is actually about pussy. I don't yeah. know if you mm -hmm. saw the uh, trailer, but yeah, there's a certain exploitative element about this movie. It's not a tribute movie. No. It's not a throwback movie. It might not even really know that it's doing these types of things, but we saw um, Black Snake Moan 
it, because it appealed to the same part of our brain advertising wise that you know planet terror appealed to our brain yeah i mean we will look at that edgy poster and there's a woman on a chain yeah and the woman is christina ricci yeah and the man is samuel L. jackson I right mean, you, well yeah you, Samuel L. Jackson screams new wave exploitation every time you see him. (laughs) Sure. He even makes Star Wars 2 and 3 new wave exploitation. Sure. But then, you know, you have Samuel L. Jackson doing new wave exploitation in The Spirit, and The Spirit says it's Sin City. Yeah. (laughs) You know? Right. The posters come out, and you go, oh, it's it's not blues. It's jazz. Yeah. It's smoky, and it's loungy. Uh, But a lot of the marketing, the covers, and the posters feature this exploitative element that I don't know if you would even think about in the movie had you not seen uh, that advertising. Sure. And what I think is most interesting about that is that in all the exploitation movies we've talked about, what's the same fucking thing, right? The movie says it's about this, and it turns out we don't get any of that. Right. It says sexy Jane Fonda in space, we get a strip tease, and then there's nothing else. It leads us, it's bait to lead us to a movie that isn't about that. But as misleading as the marketing for Black Snake Moan is, Mm -hmm. it's misleading because it goes, hey, look at the sexy woman. She's on a chain. Right. If this was a Jack Hill movie, there would be no chain in the whole fucking movie. Sure. Christina Ricci and Samuel Jackson would never meet. They would be like, sure. They would have an intermediate third party and might not even be in the film very much. Samuel L. Jackson would be flamboyantly gay for half the film. Right. (laughs) But fuck, man, not in Black Snake Moan. In Black Snake Moan, we chain her to a radiator. Sure. Why do we do that? Because she's fucking running around topless in her panties for the whole movie. Yeah. The thing that's not exploitative or misleading misleading about this is that the exploitative misleading advertising isn't misleading in the content uh, that it's trying to lure you in with. Mm -hmm. It's really giving you all the sexy of the post. Right. I think what's most interesting about the poster and, and maybe I'm getting a little meta here, but if, if you take the poster for what it is, you have Samuel L. Jackson having chained up Christina Ricci and Christina Ricci looks ready to fuck. Yeah. Samuel L. Jackson stands there stalwart like, yeah, I've got this. Sure. And from the outside, having not seen the film, having been a townsperson, having been, you know, the the pre- local preacher, you're sitting there going, wow, that black man's got that white girl chained up and he's fucking the shit out of her every night and he doesn't care. <laughs> right. Meanwhile, you see the film and it's the the image still stands up. Sure. Christina Ricci's a nymphomaniac and... Samuel L. Jackson is standing stalwart and sturdy Saying against, I got this. yeah, against the pro. I mean, he's going to fix it. He's got it, but he doesn't right. got her. Right. It's, it's still the correct image. It's just that from the outside perspective, everybody's got it wrong. Well, and so that's another great thing about advertising. People will complain about this, uh, these ads being misleading, but they also complain when ads give them too much. Right. So here we have something that lures you into the movie that actually gives you, I mean, if this were a real exploitation poster, there wouldn't be a single scene in the movie where she's in a chain. Sure. Instead, she's on a chain for most of the film. Right. It's actually, you know, the content of the movie. Well, the chain is the third character. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, but then you come in the movie and it goes, well, it is technically what we're showing you in the poster, but in a very different way. Sure. And I like that about the marketing a lot. Right. I also feel like we need to talk about the morality of putting a girl on a chain because she can't stop humping everything. Sure. Make no mistake, man. This is a film about two nut jobs. Oh, yeah. I don't know if the movie knows it's about two nut jobs, but Lazarus, so he's cloaked in altruism, right? Sure. Which that's another double feature thing is when I see altruism, I become skeptical. Uh huh. But I think he is an insane person. He's trying to help her, and so people don't see that. But he's also taking her prisoner. Right. And people are so willing to overlook the, oh, well, yeah, I I understand he's taking her prisoner, but, you know, he's trying to to help her out. He sees no other way. I think that kind of makes it more akin to something like the woman, doesn't it? Maybe. Yeah, we've chained her up, but we're, you know, we're just trying to help her out. Right. I mean, where's the morality here? I think the, the line of morality is clearly drawn many steps earlier in both of these characters lives you think so well you have christina ricci uh cheating well hers on her is easy boyfriend right. from the beginning right um using all sorts of drugs and just being terribly self-destructive but what about lazarus 
I mean, he's not doing anything good. Nobody in the movie thinks he's doing anything good. Every single yeah. person that finds out he's got a woman chained up is going, what the hell is wrong with you? Right. Yeah, I guess the other characters know. You know, when I ask that question of, does the movie know that this is way wrong? Yeah. The other characters sort of know. They at least know it's shocking. They know, yeah. I mean, I think what we're getting here is he is just as fucked up as she is and that his solution is fixing his wife. Yeah. I mean, we right. get that early on when he's tending to her wounds. This is his way. Sure, sure. This is this is how he would have handled his wife. Right. In another universe where she wanted to constantly get out of the house and and frenzied frenzied kick the door shut topless to fuck his nephew. Oh my god. Uh, possibly the best part of the entire film for me. Um he would have chained his wife up to the sturdy radiator that kept them warm for many years, and and eventually she would have realized the error of her ways. He's wrong. Christina Ricci's wrong. Everybody's wrong, but fortunately nobody's hurting each other. So Ray is tied up in a chain, and uh, Christina Ricci is actually in a chain, which is, yeah. that's another rare thing in film, especially for chains. They're almost always faked. Because they're heavy and clunky and you can hurt people with them. So they're always plastic and sold through Foley. Yeah. and Or plastic or another lightweight material. I mean, it doesn't have to be plastic. It has to be shiny and look like a chain, but not feel like one. Mm -hmm. But um, Ricci is actually wearing a chain in the whole movie. Yeah. And, you know, that's helping her keep her sex addiction at bay. But for all of the surface stuff and the exploitation-y stuff we're talking about, I actually feel like the way the movie treats sex addiction is uh, it's very simple, but it's very carefully. It's very well done. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily want to say it's realistic because of how simplified they make it. Right. But, uh, you know, something fucked up happens to her in her past. Sure. And she kind of weaponizes sex. Mm -hmm. She sort of takes it back in a way that, I mean, I think it's one of several different ways that victims of sexual trauma kind of deal with that mm -hmm. they go you know what i'm gonna make sure sex is my thing and it's not that one fucked up experience or those years of fucked up experiences that happen to me right and so for her character it's almost like she gets these flashes where she just has to fuck things right i'm experiencing this feeling right now i'm gonna go do this thing and remind myself that i'm completely in control of having sex and that's oddly the thing that makes her seem out of control is she can't stop doing that. She has this this weird, uh, almost subconscious need for empowerment so badly that it controls her. Mm -hmm. So the lines for how it's playing around with sex addiction is uh, that stuff's pretty clean to me. And I think it's really well done. But the the place that I start going, well, I have no idea what I'm talking about is in some of the racial undertones of yeah. the movie. To the point where I don't even know if they're <laughs> if they're there. This is a movie that, uh, oddly, is of the two films today, the one that I think treats race more subtly. Yeah. Almost like it's not even concerned with it. Like it's uh, unaware or, um, I, I don't know, I don't know if it's, whether it's intentional or not, I don't know if you can deny the imagery here, right? Sure. I mean, you've already used the term white girl in describing mm -hmm. her chained up. Right. Don't you think that's kind of a component of this? Yeah. Well, so I think a large part of the movie deals pretty heavily with the idea of horny white chicks mm -hmm. and kind of the double taboo of um, interracial kind of coupling. Sure. Because it's one thing, and obviously, so the one thing everybody's going to say is, oh, the black guy's got the white girl <laughs> chained up. Right. Finally, reparation. <laughs> you know, fuck you. That's not what this film is saying. Right. It's not at all what this film is saying. But there is an older black man holding a younger white girl captive. Sure. In his place. I mean, it's certainly, I don't want to say it has to evoke some kind of slavery image, but I don't know. I just feel like that's there. I think it may only be there to show you that it doesn't have to be there. Okay, sure. I think that the real thing that the film is invoking, and, and maybe I'm getting too deep into this, but I think it's less about the necessity of a white and a black character and more about if you take your average white blonde girl in the South 
she is naked on the football field. I, I, I guess not average, but more believably so, naked sure. on the football field. And then you take a, you know, a black, modestly wealthy, I mean, he's poor, right? Yeah, Probably sure. poor. Of modest wealth would be yeah. a nice way to put that, yeah. And uh, he's a farmer, and he's, you know, a blues guitarist, believes very, very strongly in the Bible. Um, Although I would like to uh, take a moment to say I think less so as the film goes on. Sure. It's less about who's white and black. Mm -hmm. It's more about these characters are more believably white and black. Yeah, you know, there's there's never a moment where you would go, wow, you'll never find someone like Christina Ricci. What an unbelievable yeah, character. Exactly. Or Samuel Jackson's character. Sure. You don't think for a moment, you know, if I go down south, it would be very hard to find an individual like this. Sure. And I think that because Christina Ricci is white, she's unfamiliar with the blues. and She's unfamiliar with sure. that kind of like grassroots farming right bible banging tiny shack yeah and he's unfamiliar with the fucking blonde slutty whoremonger who fucks on the football field <laughs> yeah it's a weird thing where the advertising was something that i look at and i go uh this is one of those moments where there's something racial going on but i'm kind of oblivious to it but then when I watched the movie, I barely considered that at all. Yeah. I don't know if once I went through. I mean, is that true for you? I think David Banner's a racist. <laughs> yeah. That's about as deep as I'm going to go. His character or David Banner? <laughs> um, I think that hip hop and rap is a racist uh, culture. Sure. Um, I think that that's part of its strength and part of its weakness is that most of hip hop and rap is racist. Interesting. And I think this is is part of the other invocation of the film is uh, he's got this notion that the white girl comes to the black guy for a good fucking and the rest is just kind of play. Sure. Yeah. I mean, if she really wants to get laid, she'll come fuck a big black guy. <laughs> right. um, but otherwise, you know, she's fine toying around with your your average white fellow. Other than that, I don't think there's any invocation of race, really. Yeah. I mean, we hit on it in this conversation. I think it's uh, it's far more about the blues than it is about race. Mm -hmm. And it's probably about race only in so much as the blues is, if not, you know, if not less. It's more about that culture. Yeah. And uh, any kind of racial disparity would be from Ray not having a lot of past in the blues. Exactly. And, uh, you know, Samuel Jackson's character having a lot of history there, having a, a real connection to that. Mm hmm. Which gets me to this uh, electric guitar scene. Oh, my God. Which, I mean, uh, I'm going to be honest with you, man. None of this other stuff fucking matters to me at all. Yeah. In comparison to how good this goddamn guitar yeah. scene is. Yeah. Um, it's the one towards the end. Before he actually does a whole set. But when right. it's just... During the thunderstorm. During the thunderstorm. It's just the two of them in this room. And Samuel Jackson is telling stories and playing guitar. And man, it's just that great fuzzy reverb blues guitar. You know, he's got the thing stored away under the bed. It's not the normal one he takes out and plays. This is a fucking special occasion guitar. Mm -hmm. He's got his little combo amp and the rain is pouring down and the power's going in and out. And I mean, this is everything that the movie knows it excels at. Yeah. All of its little sound cues and audio stuff to indicate how the characters are feeling and that. Ray is getting horny. Mm -hmm. It's also these moments that I don't think the film um, pats itself on the back enough for, which is these kind of cool lighting. You know, sure. Christina Ricci is a centerpiece on a couch with chain wrapped exactly. around her kind of yeah. scenes. But yeah, we have that that fake moon backlighting that just looks right. fucking great. And the power's going in and out and the sound's swelling. And man, just... The way it builds this kind of tense crescendo while also invoking all of the themes of the movie, mm -hmm. it's something that's not just eye candy. It's trying to tell you about, all right, these characters have a connection in this moment. Right. It's the moment where they're checking to see if they're ready. Sure. You know? Yeah. To go, wow, uh, do we have a handle on this yet? And as the power goes in and out and she's kind of breaking down and you're really getting into her head and seeing how this fucks with her, it's just done so well. Oh, yeah. I feel spent just talking about that scene. 
uh the this little light of mine scene in comparison uh-huh. uh, has nothing on no. the blues scenes but the this little light of mine scene is where you and i both uh choose to believe the movie ends there's a gunshot and uh fade to black monster's ball is uh man while we're just cutting through to the truth here uh, we've been getting really heavy on this show, and I'd like to keep it down to earth. Uh-huh. Can I talk to you about the actual reason Monsters Ball is famous? I that think we... everybody knows why Monsters Ball. You want to talk about you want to talk about subtle uh, subtle undertones in a film. It's a notable drama because of its artistic such and such. Blah blah that... blah blah blah. Storms tits. <laughs> By storm, you mean you'll have to uh, for people who are not versed with the comic world. <laughs> Storm is a uh, a comic book character, the right. likes of which you've not heard us talk about in Double Feature because um, we haven't had a Kickstarter yet the, uh, where people <laughs> force us to start doing comic book uh, films. Storm is from the X-Men series, notably played in the films by Halle Berry, who is naked and gets very realistically fucked for at least 20% of this movie. Hey, everybody, let's go see Monsters Ball. Yeah, it's uh, this is I mean, there's a lot more to Monsters Ball. We would both agree with that, right? Yeah, I'm not it's trying to some important things and it has a lot of great ideas. I'm not trying to downplay Monsters Ball. I'm trying to I'm trying to get everybody to admit that they saw Monsters Ball because Halle Berry gets the shit fucked out of her. Well, this is a draw of films we haven't discussed. We choose yeah. to overlook it so we can just get right into themes and so forth. But sure, it would have probably only been a moderately successful drama maybe just as good i mean i don't know who's to who's to say oh what would a film have been like if it did or didn't have these things but it was instead made a big fucking deal of because of the nudity because yeah. people want to see holly berry fuck yeah and the reason i wanted to bring this up is there's kind of an entire industry of films uh, this is a whole the the way we look at movies and think about directors sure there's other people who look at movies and think about whose tits are in this movie well you know what i mean yeah and it's weird because i definitely i think i've got plenty of credential to come on here and say i'm not that type of person i watch films based on directors and then producers and then writers and then eventually actors and then vagina right well you and i are lucky to live in an age where we have the internet right so I mean, that's never been, I'm not going to, you know, come on the show and go, well, I don't care about tits. Yeah. I mean, no. we have the internet. Well, I mean, I think, I think a perfect example of this is that you and I will watch a film. We'll be watching a film together and one of us will just be like, huh, she's kind of hot. I'm going to Google and see if she's naked anywhere. Well, yeah, that's a benefit of just watching movies. Is right. You just insert the actor's name and nude into the internet. Right. I mean, you don't need so. But anyway, the, the thing that's bizarre to me about this culture of of naked celebrities in film <laughs> is that I not even as one of those people, for whatever reason, get these mental updates that I don't know where the hell they come from, where suddenly I know, you know there's a film called Melancholia coming out. Oh, Kirsten Dunst is topless in that. I don't know how I know. Right. I'll be sitting at a restaurant with a group of people whom I barely know or know some of and and somebody will mention melancholia or having seen melancholia or that it's coming out or there's a poster for it over there. I think Swordfish is also a really yeah. good example of this. Another Halle Berry movie. But you where get, you know about the movie because someone's naked in it. Yeah, and somebody says melancholia. One guy goes, Oh, isn't Kirsten Dunst topless in that? And I go, Yes, she is. And he says, How was it? And I go, I haven't seen it. And he says, Neither have I. Yeah, nobody's seen it. Everybody knows somebody's naked in it. Yeah, but it's not as if it's in the trailer. It just, uh, it's just, you're knowledge. right. It's, everybody it's, gets mentally pinged yeah. somehow. Yeah, it's a weird thing. Swordfish is the same way. I feel like I'm in a minority because I've actually seen Swordfish. Yeah, never seen Swordfish. 90% of the people who know about Swordfish know that Halle Berry's kind of naked yeah. in it. Yeah. This is one of those things that goes back to. You remember we had Jeremy Kasten on, and he was talking to us about how we want to see our actors naked. Yeah. I mean, I think it goes back to that. In the 70s, everybody was getting naked. Mm-hmm. And now in films, actors, the, the type of commodity they are is that they are prized and cherished and kept locked away in a, a secret box, and we are allowed to view them at certain times. And coming on screen and being naked is... uh. I don't know. It's just something that's done less often. Yeah. I don't think it should be, but it's done less often. Stranger Still is that 
this is just a thing about movies we've never talked about. Yeah. Also, hey, it's Detective Loomis from Blood Feast 2. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's something else that needs to come up. John McConnell uh, appears again as one of the detention officers. I told you I'd fucking seen that guy in other places. <laughs> I knew it. Um, he's, uh, he's part of this. Mark Forster is the director. Uh, aside from doing one of those James Bond things, he also did Stranger Than Fiction and mm-hmm. Finding Neverland. Yeah. So both Mark Forster and Craig Brewer fall into a very similar spot in my mind of directors that I'm kind of curious about and I wish they'd make more stuff that I could see. So I feel like, aside from the racial stuff that I do want to get to, the father figure idea, Mm -hmm. terrible fathers, this is a terrible father movie, I think. We come across these every once in a while, but for just such a variety of, of ways. You can identify it's kind of a motif of the film because it reoccurs in so many different characters' paths yeah. or all throughout this single family. The fact that it is reoccurring kind of seems like that's part of what the movie wants to talk about. Sure. You know, you have Hank's father, who is completely stuck in his ways. He's the most obvious one, the old fucking racist guy who lives on sure. the couch, the older generation. Mm-hmm. While he, he's set in these kind of racist ways... He's also just set in his way. He doesn't like the idea of his son changing jobs. Sure. You know, that's something we don't talk about a lot, but I think part of getting older generations over ideas about race, about sexuality, about, um, you know, feminism is that they've been around a long time and it's just hard to get them to go with new ideas sometimes. Yep. You know, he talks to his son about, well, he wouldn't have bought a gas station. He would have stuck to what he knows best. Mm -hmm. I really love that scene too towards the end because how the movie plays it. When he insults Letitia, when she comes over and he makes his remarks and I'm supposed to feel this, you know, this drama between Hank and his father but instead, it kind of reads like a smash cut to him being put in a fucking home. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So that that's one of the most interesting things about Hank's character throughout this film is I'm so used to in film having people um, run into problems where I don't know, just off the top of my head, their brother commits suicide. Their father's a horrible racist. Their son died their mother killed themselves sure, sure they're in love with a woman who can't tolerate them whose son just died they just executed a man these are just some things that come to mind and hank just kind of walks through it all yeah i'm used to seeing character presented with conflict roundabout resolution to conflict 30 minutes later next thing happens right but with hank he's kind of he he is the most unwavering oddball human being i mean yeah how how often does your father be too racist and you just go hey, i'm just putting him in a home <laughs> anyway <laughs> right. now i'm gonna go get some coffee well you know it's the way he uh he treats it i'm sure it is really fucking hard for him but he just sees things as kind of inevitabilities and you know it's something he has to accept that probably comes a little bit from working on death row you know, you deal with some of these heavy things. Sure. That's just how it's got to be. So we already know he's a hardened person. He works in the Department of Corrections on death row. That's, I mean, that's a deep look into the type of person he is. Sure. But then you get this thing that we're constantly presented with in film where you hate a member of your family. You hate, so he hates his son. Mm-hmm. I hate you and you ruined that guy's last walk and you're a fuck up and I hate you and you're the worst. And now you killed yourself. I miss you so much. And I, <laughs> right. I just, I never really valued you. No, fuck that. Sure. His son commits suicide and suddenly he just goes, wow. Okay. Um, that was my one real responsibility. Yeah. I'm going to become a person who's leading a life that I would rather lead. I no longer have to, uh, take care of my son. I no longer have to deal with my racist father. I no longer have to work at this horribly, yeah upsetting job i no longer have to not date pretty black women i'm just going to uh i'm gonna set my sights at the end goal which is to own a gas station and that's what i'm gonna do and be happy yeah yeah it's really weird isn't it how many of these things you know you kind of feel like oh i see where this is going yeah you know Sonny kills himself and right after asking his father if he hates him Mm -hmm. and you know then going oh yeah well i love you shoots himself i mean this should be the heaviest thing 
in the world. It should give Hank all this anxiety about, is he responsible? And I mean, man, maybe some of that stuff comes, but it seems like the character can't even be, I guess he's bothered with it. He has to be bothered with it. But in his action, what you see is quits death row job, eats ice cream. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. This is a, it's definitely a death row movie too, which uh, there aren't a lot of, but um, every time I see one, I kind of go, does this take a little inspiration maybe from the Green Mile? Sure. It's one of those things, it's hard to say, you know, this movie comes out in 2001, Green Mile is like 1999. I know this had been in development for a couple of years, but Green Mile was a novel in the mid nineties or whatever. I just think it's an odd subject matter. Sure. You don't see it a lot. And what's always amazing to me about these movies and why I even bring this up is every time you see an execution, a death row execution portrayed in film, it's awful. And even in movies, I mean, it just never feels right or justified. It's always disgusting. Mm -hmm. And that's something that, I mean, films deal with death all the time. They deal with death from a way more cartoonish uh, I mean, if you're just going to look at all data from all films on a whole, mm -hmm. death is treated a lot lighter than it is in reality. Yeah. In almost every case. Sure. Uh, eliminating outliers in that data set, every fucking case. Yeah. It's easy to just go around and knock people off and shoot people and people die. But man, just like real life, executing human beings is fucking disgusting. And maybe it's a little unfair, but I'm going to take this as, you know, evidence against capital punishment every time i see an execution in a film sure but the other big thing is the racial overtones oh yeah so you know some heavy father stuff some heavy death row stuff and uh just a little bit of racial overtones no big deal yeah i mean the thing that's really bizarre about the the racial things in this movie is we get uh so we get leticia and she says this thing um about you know he's a black kid what what are the cops even gonna do right what does that mean i mean <laughs> she, so she also when, says he's a black kid in america he can't be fat you right. know how it is being black in america you can't be fat it's yeah. just not a thing you can do what so <laughs> yeah one, i don't know what she's one talking of about. my biggest questions with this film and mm -hmm. one of the things that confuses me is i don't know when this film is supposed to take place oh sure because i've been to the south it's not hard. It's half of the United States. I mean, I haven't been everywhere. Sure. It, it's so much less racist. We've already seen two black cops in this film. <laughs> right. Like, I, I really can't get a grasp on the racial overtones, which leads me to believe that Letitia is just generally a self-deprecating human being. Well, yeah. I mean, she look, life has given her a bad hand, right? Yeah. I mean, husband dies. Son dies, has nothing, lost finds her herself job. in a, but interestingly, finds herself in the very same situation that seems to empower Hank. Sure. Father goes away, son dies, doesn't have a job anymore. Right. I mean, it's exact. No, a big yeah. part of it comes from the fact that he picked these choices, and maybe that does make it kind of different. Well, I but mean, it's strange he did... that he finds these things empowering. Sure. Well, and that I think is why the way things wrap up after the 30 minutes of hardcore sexual intercourse. <laughs> I think that's why it's such a powerful moment for me and a massive, massive credit to this film that uh, the, the end scene. Well, so before we talk about the end, I, right. I wanted to ask you about some of the stuff that it got me thinking after our King Kong conversation on Mars needs women. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. That maybe I just don't recognize some of these things. This is always a movie that's pitched as a story about a racist correctional officer. Mm -hmm. And that never sticks with me. Yeah. I mean, do we have evidence of Hank being racist outside of kicking some kids off his lawn that really I feel like is more to appease his father? That's how I felt, too. I, I really don't. The only time I see what may be considered by the filmmakers of crash as latent racism. Oh, sure. Is when not of Cronenberg crash, but of right. other crash. Yeah. Uh, when he is beating the shit out of Sonny and the black cop gets up in his business and he goes off on him. Right. Because the, the cop's black you see, and he's white. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's the, and only... the cop's black. Yeah. But he's not black. Right. He's white. Exactly. I mean, and, and he uses racial slurs and, and what the fuck ever, but I, 
other than that, and that is one of those things where people will be like, see, he is racist because in his time of most heated passion, he uses racial slurs. And I'm going to go, no, he's not racist. In his time of most heated passion, he uses the words his father used growing up. Yeah, it's it's hard for me because, you know, to talk about racist correctional officer, I don't see that in the movie. But I, you know, I watch it digitally, but I'm pretty sure it's on the DVD jacket. You know, it seems like something they intended. How can we call this guy racist when he hates his son to the point of his son committing suicide, partially because his son ruined the last walk of a black criminal? Right. And that seems, you know, uh, I look at that and go, well, it doesn't really matter that the criminal is black. But I look at that in the same way as going, well, it doesn't matter that the guy he snapped at is black or that the kids he told to get off his lawn are black. Exactly. I just, I watch this and I wonder how much I'm oblivious to. I worried I'm missing out on this whole level of films that, because I've never really been around racism in my life, I yeah. can't reckon. I mean, is chocolate ice cream a metaphor? Like, I don't fucking know. <laughs> you know what I mean? Every time he says chocolate ice chocolate cream. Chocolate ice and, cream and black coffee. And nobody says anything for a second. I go, should I be, yeah. should I be writing this down? I don't know what's happening here. Yeah, no, that's a, that's just. <laughs> But yeah, Letitia and the ending. You know, I love Letitia, uh, Halle Berry's character being a wonderful fucking mess. Yes. And I think this will come around to your point about the ending, but the scene in the beginning that starts everything between the two of them, where she invites Hank in for a drink and, you know, they just get wasted, or maybe uh -huh. her specifically, she has this breakdown that is so true and vulnerable and messy in a way that. I mean, she is very drunk, but she's not, you know, cool, sad drunk or dark brooding, slick movie drunk. Mm -hmm. She is embarrassing, loud, sob drunk. Yeah, she's not Christopher Hitchens drunk. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Christopher Hitchens in real life was the way people are drunk in movies. Mm -hmm. Holly Berry in movies uh, in this particular movie is just, you know, you wouldn't want her to be in public. She's just repeating, make me feel good, and then laughing, and then sobbing, and then laughing again. She is a fucking mess. But uh, after, you know, the white man saves her, uh, we get to this this ending scene. The white oh. man doesn't save her, right? Is that a no. thing? No. That's a thing people probably think, right? Probably, but they're wrong. Um, the, the ending of this movie is absolutely incredible because... I agree with you. I really love it. Like I said, we have this thing where... Fucking Hank is going through a movie and all these bad things are happening to him. And he's just kind of going, you know, this will be fine. I'm going to buy this gas station. I met this woman. This is great. I mean, she's mad at me, but she'll get over it because that's what normal people do. Right. Meanwhile, he's still naming the gas station. after, right. Much to your point about him letting yeah. things roll off. <laughs> she's pissed and won't talk to him. And he's still painting her name on a gas station. And Letitia is this loose cannon, terribly self-deprecating character who seems on the brink of you know, suicide or just flying off the handle into some extreme. And we get this moment where she discovers that Hank, I mean, she doesn't discover the full depth of the affiliation, but she definitely discovers that Hank knew her husband in prison. And she knows that Hank used to be a corrections officer. Now, this could be the moment that the entire movie is building toward. Right. right? The big reveal. What's going to happen? These characters, they're growing to know each other and love each other. And you know there's a secret connection between Hank right. and her well, late husband. And the other thing that, that is really interesting as an analysis here is this is the only thing that it seems like Hank is too uncomfortable to deal with involving her. Sure. He's completely forward. He puts his father in a rest home. But she mentions her husband draws portraits. You, he gets that look of, oh, shit. Yeah. This is the one thing that's bothered me the entire film. Yeah. She's about to confront him, maybe shoot him in the face. She's about to bring this film down to what could be another half hour of reconciliation or or battling or just the uh, acclaimed double feature downer ending of fuck yeah. you. You lied to me. I'm leaving. I'm going to marry most deaf. Right. <laughs> but instead, she sits out on the stoop with him just with this horrible look of just being a devastated, broken human. And he starts talking about his day. And, you know, the gas station and whatever. And, and he is just undying and unflinching in his dedication to her at this point. And a character who 
throughout the film has just been easily moved. You see this look in her face like, you know what? It's time for me to let go the way he's letting go. Yeah. It's time for me to be a stronger person because look at what he's done for me. Sure. And he didn't do anything wrong. It was his job. He doesn't want to, you know, you get all this, this rush of explanation. Right. And it's all within her looking in a different direction and half smiling. I mean, there is no dialogue to the effect of this. And it explains the entire film. Well, I love, too, that she does have a natural reaction when she first finds out. Sure. It's a lot more realistic that way. It's not expecting you to think she just finally got to a place in her life where she can act like that. It hits her, and she reacts like anyone would. Uh -huh. She goes, oh, my God, the pieces just came together. Yeah. How do, I, how do I live with this? What do I do? Why didn't he tell me? All this stuff rushes through her head, and he comes back. And he notices. He's mm -hmm. not oblivious. He goes, hey, are you cool? Okay, cool. Let's, you know, let's go sit on the soup. He starts eating ice cream. And, uh, and you get to see it on her face. You get to see her go, all right, I'm dealing with this. I'm processing it. No, you know what? This whole movie, Hank's been empowering himself. And I've been letting things crush me. And I have the ability here. I'm going to say, fuck it. We've both been through a lot. Uh, let's just let ourselves be happy. Mm-hmm. Which is, of course, the again the line at the end of the movie. Yeah, everything's going to be outside, all right. Yeah, looking at gravestones, going, I, I think it's going to be all right. If you're detecting a theme, uh, I think it's going to be all right. Um, let me remind you that at least fifty percent of the hosts of Double Feature have constant anxiety about their Kickstarter at <laughs> Kickstarter Double Show dot com isn't this killing you it's horrible it has to be killing it's you the worst <laughs> <laughs> what's gonna happen oh my god where are we gonna be in several days uh it's kickstarter.doublefeatureshow.com i was really hoping you would just go no eric i think i think we're gonna be all right mm -hmm. but that's really up to the listeners if the listeners could say that using dollars right. that they throw at kickstarter.doublefeatureshow.com then we won't have to put double feature in a home for being <laughs> racist and offensive. Oh my God, it's all coming together. Uh, what are we? In the meantime, we're gonna keep fucking doing this show until uh, until we know what the future holds. All right, Kickstarter dot show dot com. This is the end, people. Um, uh, what are we doing next time? Next time we're gonna get dramatically and visually bizarre. Uh, we're going to do Tarsum sings the cell, and we're going to pair that with. Nicholas Winding Refn's Valhalla Rising. Um, if you thought the David Lynch pair was weird, <laughs> watch more fucking film. Bye. <laughs>